Discord button. Great, welcome everyone to this webinar with uh, Dennis Pilon, who will be talking about alternative vote, commonly known as ranked ballot. Uh, Dennis Pilon is an associate professor at York University in political science. Uh, he's Canada's top voting reform expert. He's also published several articles, two books, and a lot more. Um, so before we get started, I'd just like to acknowledge that the land on which Dennis and I both are located on has for thousands of years been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Today, Toronto is home to many ind Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to them for the opportunity to work on this land. So the structure of this call will be Dennis, talking, giving a presentation for about 15, 20 minutes, and then we'll take your questions until 7.45, after which Anita and David Heap will join the call and, and take us in another direction. So I'll pass this over to Dennis. Great, well, thank you. Uh, and, and, and thanks to all of you for coming out tonight. It's fantastic to see such a, such a great turnout on something that was a fairly, I think, short notice organized event. Uh, so I hope that it will be worth your time in terms of the information that I want to share. And I'm happy to take questions on, on any range of issues related to, to our topic tonight or adjacent issues around voting system reform. Um, I just remind you that if you want to follow up with any of the things that I've talked about, uh, if you Google my Academia EDU page, just Dennis Pilon, uh, you'll find all my publications. Uh, in fact, a full copy of my book, The Politics of Voting, and uh, you can find a lot of information on there. Um, okay, so with that in mind, I'm going to share my screen. I have a PowerPoint. I am a professor after all. Um, do, 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 slideshow, play from start. Okay, uh, well, now, if we run into any technical difficulties, please do let me know. Sometimes uh, slides don't move, things happen, it's kind of weird, so, uh, but just let me know. All right, so here uh, tonight, we're going to talk about uh, rank ballots and why they are not the top banana when it comes to uh, issues around voting system reform. So let's start with what? I, I mean, I know some of you know all this. I, I see a lot of people from across the country who are very expert on this topic, but I, I figured I better throw in some newbie stuff just in case you're just joining us so that everybody can, can kind of get up to speed. And basically, we need to understand ranked ballots as part of a broader uh, uh, landscape of voting system options. And there are basically four kinds of voting systems into which we can fit all sorts of, of, of different variations. But basically, there's four kinds. There's the plurality system, majority, uh, proportional, and uh, semi-proportional. That's where we put everything else that doesn't fit uh, together. Um, and there's a lot of variations between and within uh, these voting system families. Uh, obviously with plurality, we can have single member and multi-member plurality. Uh, City of Vancouver uses multi-member plurality or at-large voting as a form of plurality. With majority voting, uh, they can also be conducted in single or multi-member ridings uh, and still be a majority uh, system. And we know them, uh, of course, tonight we're going to talk about the ranked ballot or alternative vote. But of course, there's also the, the double ballot, the French system, the runoff system, uh, where they have an election and then another election two weeks later. And then with proportional, we've got more choices. Roughly three main kinds of proportional representation are used around uh, the world. And then a host of what we call semi-proportional voting systems that uh, you know, aren't as unrepresentative as first past the post, but aren't as representative as proportional options. So rank ballot it gets a bit confusing because uh, you know rank ballot, AKA, there are uh, also known as uh, other names for rank ballot. So sometimes you'll see rank ballots referred to as uh, the transferable ballot. Uh, that was very common in Canada at the municipal level uh, in the early 20th century. Um, you, you, it's more conventional in Canada, the United Kingdom, Australia, New Zealand to see the ranked ballot referred to as the alternative vote. That is the historic uh, vote, uh, a historic name. Um, the Americans invented a new name uh, back in the, in the 80s and 90s, instant runoff voting, and that is how they refer to, to ranked balloting. These are all the same system, different names exactly the same voting system. Now, what it isn't 
uh, is the single transferable vote. And there was a lot of confusion about this at different points. And it's because both systems use a ranking mechanism. Both allow voters to rank their choices, one, two, three, four, five, but they are crucially different. And the crucial difference has to do with the formula that is used to decide how someone wins a seat. Uh, and obviously with the, with the ranked ballot, the formula is a, is a majority formula. Whereas with, of course, the single transferable vote, it's a proportional one. All right, well, how do they work? I'm just gonna, you know, this is just a basic, you know, breakdown here. If we had a plurality election, and you've seen this kind of result tons of times when, when you've been watching elections, right? Party A gets 40 votes, party B gets 35, and party C gets 25. So the winner is party A. Even though party A is not wanted by most of the people, the majority of people don't want party A, but nonetheless, they're stuck with party A because that's the function. That's the way that the plurality system uh, produces the result. Uh, now, in ranked ballots, that result wouldn't be good enough. Uh, it, it wouldn't be a winner after the first round of voting. And instead, the second choices of uh, party C would be redistributed on the basis of what did people mark as their number second choice on all of the ballots for uh, the party C candidate. Well, in my mock election example, uh, now suddenly party B has emerged as the winner. Of course, it's possible that party A would have been the winner anyway. Um, that does happen in, in ranked ballot situations. But the point is that the, the dispersal of the votes for party C could conceivably change the result because in this case, the winner needs a majority. Well, what are some of the claims that we have heard from people about this ranked ballot system? Uh, well, liberal leader, provincial liberal leader here in Ontario, Del Duca, has claimed that ranked ballots will lead to a politics of collaboration uh, and that it will reward parties that find common ground and speak to voters' hopes, not fears. That sounds lovely. Who, who, who wouldn't want to get on to this campaign? Others claim that it will reduce strategic voting, it will reduce wasted votes, it will incre increase the influence of small parties. And of course, other questions we could ask related to the democratic deficit in this country is, what will ranked ballots do about executive dominance or representation or party competition? These, I think, are the questions we should be asking when we address whether or not ranked ballot is really worth the effort. <clears throat> Well, how do we judge the claims that have been made by these different actors? Simplistically, some people look at Ontario politics, and we're talking about this in the context of Ontario tonight, um, and they assume that the ranked ballot would allow a non-conservative party voting majority to avoid vote splitting and win. That's, I think, the basic, uh, you know, the basic rationale, and, and it's appealing. But it's far from clear that that would be the result. For evidence of what might reasonably occur, we, we can look at some, some comparable examples of the use of the system in other countries and in other historical times. So we've got a century of experience using uh, the alternative vote, the ranked ballot in Australia. And of course, we also have historical use of ranked ballots right here in Canada, 17 elections uh, in Alberta, Manitoba, and British Columbia between 1920 and 1957. These are provincial elections. So uh, quite a bit of, of experience here with um, the use of ranked ballots. Well, what does that experience tell us? Uh, let's look at some different themes. Uh, what about ranked balloting and collaboration? Well, the short answer from uh, the Australian and Canadian experience is not much. Uh, the ranked balloting is not the ticket to increased collaboration, a reduced partisanship, uh, in a legislature. Uh, that doesn't appear to have been the experience uh, in, in, these, in these other uh, jurisdictions. So in, in the Australian context, uh, the ranked ballot was adopted when the two right-wing parties felt they were facing uh, competition from the Labour Party. And specifically, it was the Labour Party's agenda, uh, particularly a kind of pro-worker, uh, you know, interfere with the market uh, kind of approach that these two parties, one a farmer party, one a more business oriented party uh, were very much against. And so they collaborated together to avoid splitting their votes to defeat labor, to prevent labor from coming to power. And so uh, what occurred after that was not a kind of open-ended process of collaboration. Instead, what the system did was entrench a fairly deep partisan divide between left and right. And so, and which remains in place today. Uh, so the ranked ballot in Australia 
did lead to some collaboration between these two parties, uh, the, the, the business party and the farmer party, um, but it didn't lead them to work with labor under no circumstances were they prepared uh, to reach across uh, the aisle and work with labor. In the Canadian context, there is also very little uh, evidence that uh, the use of the ranked ballot led to any kind of increased cooperation between parties. Um, it was an interesting time back in the 1920s uh, on the prairies, you had farmers uh, who started their own parties uh, and they did come to power in two provinces. And initially it did look like they were gonna work with what were gonna be their urban based uh, labor uh, allies. But very quickly, um, things moved in a different direction. And so the farmers brought in uh, proportional voting in the urban centers. And that sounds great. Wow, some proportional voting. But of course, the downside of that was that the farmers weren't running in the urban areas. And, uh, and what it did was it had the effect of dividing their opponents while maintaining unity for them. So they used the alternative vote in, in rural areas, which basically had the effect of channeling support back to them as the largest party. This is, of course, also what happens in Australia. In Australia, it sounds like a great deal. It sounds like you'll be able to have all this competition, these other parties. But in actual fact, what it does is it tends to just funnel support back to the major parties rather than uh, leading to a greater level of, of political diversity uh, being represented. Now, what's interesting about the adoption of the ranked ballot in Australia was that it, it didn't lead to cooperation, it resulted, it resulted from it. So uh, basically, uh, it, was, it was after the parties de decided to collaborate that they then adopted the alternative vote not the other way around. And as I suggested, uh, more hope, not fear is hardly how we would characterize Australia's hyper-partisan uh, politics. What about competition? To what extent does the ranked ballot answer questions of, uh, you know, can we have a more representative parliament? That's one of the concerns around the dem democratic deficit. To what extent does the ranked ballot encourage or allow for greater competition. Uh, yeah, that is one of the arguments that we have typically heard that the ranked ballot would allow people to support, for instance, a new party without risking wasting their vote. Well, again, the evidence doesn't support the view that the ranked ballot will lead to greater uh, party competition. In fact, party systems that have used it in both these jurisdictions have remained static for a very long period of time. Nor do ranked ballots lead to better representation of party choices. In fact, the research that compares ranked balloting to first past the post has found <clears throat> that ranked ballot systems have been just as disproportional. The evidence doesn't support the view that ranked ballots help smaller parties uh, either get election or gain influence. And in the situations where they have gained influence in the Australian uh, a situation, it's often because the party has more clout in the Senate, which is elected proportionately, as opposed to the lower house, which uses the ranked ballot. And the evidence doesn't suggest that ranked ballots help to improve the representation of social diversity, especially when we compare them to PR. In fact, we have some fantastic examples of how these two systems perform quite differently in the same country with the same group of voters voting at the same time. Because Australia uses uh, the single transferable vote form of a proportional representation for elections to its upper house, we can compare what voters are doing. Occasionally, they have elections in Australia where they vote for both of the houses at the same time. So the same group of voters go into the polling booths and they've got to make choices about the lower house and the upper house. And what's fascinating is that there is a distinctly different level of diverse representation in the upper house using proportional voting than in the lower house. The lower house, even though it's the same voters, um, they cannot get the same level of diversity, nowhere near the level of diversity that they've been able to achieve in the proportionally elected upper house. Well, what about strategic voting? Surely that is one of the biggest claims that we hear made about the value of ranked ballots is that it will reduce some of the strategic dilemmas that voters face. You know, I, I like party X, but gosh, it doesn't seem like they're competitive and I, I don't want party Z to win. So I guess I better vote for party Y. Uh, well, the, the argument about the ranked ballot is that it allows voters to make their first choice without worrying about wasting it uh, and allowing a party they really don't like uh, to gain election. Well, again, the evidence from countries using the ranked ballot doesn't support the idea that this strategic utopia uh, will emerge with the use of ranked ballots. 
Um, and so we've got a number of, of cases that we can look at. We can't use the Australian results as much because in addition to using ranked ballots, they also uh, have a rule that forces voters to rank all the candidates that are running in an election. Uh, and so it's hard for us to know whether or not people are using the system strategically uh, or simply surrendering to what the, the system allows them or forces them to do. But we do have a lot of elections in Canada that we can look at, 17 provincial elections over uh, the time period from the 20s up to the end of the 50s. And what's interesting there is that while initially in some cases voters appeared to use the opportunity of the ranked ballot, it seems that over time, basically people lost interest. Uh, people were uninterested in making subsequent choices and many of the ballots become exhausted over time. Uh, so a higher proportion of voters are basically just voting for their first choice and no others. Another way we can try to look at the degree to which voters are able to use the strategic aspect of the voting is to look at in how many cases uh, did the, the use of the ballot lead to a change in the results. And here we can see that very rarely uh, did it lead to a result. Just 2%, 2.6% uh, of the ridings in Alberta and 1.6 in Manitoba did the ranked ballot make any difference in the outcome of the election, uh, which is one way of indicating whether or not voters have had any impact. Now, BC did see some impact in the two elections that it used it in, in 52 and 53, but we only have those two elections and the condition of those two elections was a fairly uh, uh, wild moment of party system instability. So it's hard for us to draw conclusions from it. What about Ontario? Would the ranked ballot allow for a progressive majority to emerge? The flaw in this reasoning is in forgetting that the Liberal Party provincially and federally is a coalition of interests. Uh, and they have a progressive side, but they also have a business side. And so we shouldn't assume that the voters who vote Liberal are going to make choices in a progressive direction as, as, as or all are going to make a choice in a progressive direction as their second choice. And here I would just draw on some polling that was done in 2013. Now it's looking at federal voters, but it showed that 57% of federal liberals would choose the New Democrats as their second choice, but 28% chose the conservatives. And interestingly, a significant number of conservatives chose the liberals as their second choice. So it's not clear uh, the direction that the uh, vote switching would go, um, which leads to you know, some, some interesting questions. I'm gonna wrap up my comments now, uh, just sort of draw together. Uh, I think you know, what we need to ask ourselves when we ask if supporting ranked ballot is really worth it. And I think that you know, if we go back to the claims of Del Duca, if you want inter-party collaboration, and if you want more hope and less fear in Ontario politics, then you've got to improve party competition and you've got to provide more accurate representation of different party choices. And the dynamic that occurs in proportional systems uh, creates a, a positive strategic environment, one that also, under the right conditions, leads to more diverse representation socially, as well as politically. Um, and so if those are the things you want, then what you want is a form of proportional representation, not a form of ranked balloting. Thank you. Great, that was great. Thank you, Dennis. Um, so we've got two questions so far in the Q&A box. I'll just remind everyone, if you have a question for Dennis, please put it in the Q&A box there, not the chat. Um, Mark is asking why we don't correct people that it's not ranked ballots. They're talking about AV or instant runoff. <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, uh, well, we always run into these kinds of problems, and partly, I guess, it's um, it's a it's a kind of almost a pragmatic uh, response that you know here we have people using their uh, ability to mobilize uh, to name something, and now we can get in and say mm, you're using the wrong terms, blah 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 blah, but then we're using our time apparently for many people just fighting over the words um, when in fact I think we can we can use the conversation to put into the conversation the things that we think are important. And of course, we can also try to clarify for people and say that, that uh, you know, ranking is not 
uh, what defines a voting system. Uh, ranking is a feature of many voting systems. Uh, and you know, we can obviously throw that in as a, as a footnote. But ultimately, we, we have to take up the opportunities that emerge. Uh, and the opportunity that has emerged is that this Ontario Liberal leader has, has made a, a claim for a voting system, and we can dispute those claims. Uh, Tom Cullen, and I believe someone else, are asking for concrete examples or evidence that, well, so Tom is asking for evidence that AV yields a result even less fair or proportional than first past the post. Um, the other person is just asking for concrete examples. Right. So in the context of this kind of presentation, you know, I could throw up a bunch of charts and graphs and, you know, just we would go by people, you know, it, it, it's not the kind of uh, venue to go into that. But if you want to have a look at some of the evidence, I mean, I wrote a piece for a journal um, uh, where I, I basically said, all right, Justin Trudeau, here's your evidence, right? Justin Trudeau had said, you know, uh, well, we don't have any evidence about what the systems do. Uh, and so I go into much more detail there. Um, and, you know, connected to that is a, is a bibliography where you can find other sources that go into more detail uh, about, um, about that claim. Basically, the claim is that, that under first past the post, it's possible for a regionally concentrated view to gain representation, uh, even if they don't have uh, as much support elsewhere. Um, and so sometimes that means that... Um, a minority view can get representation. Under the alternative vote, um, in a sense, be, by forcing every contest in every geographic locale to be pushed up to a majority, it's a very anti-minoritarian approach. Uh, and so, you know, you look at the historic results for, I mean, I'll just use the example of the New Democratic Party, but, you know, the New Democratic Party, more than other parties, uh, doesn't approach the majority uh, in, in, a, in, in, in the ridings that it wins. And of course, it's also underrepresented across the country as a whole. Um, and so at least we could say that under first past the post, it gets some representation. Um, but of course, in, in, um, in, uh, in, a, in a majority alternative vote system, uh, it might get no representation. So that's why we say that the alternative vote is even worse uh, than, than first past the post. Since we're talking about evidence, uh, Jessica is asking if there's any more recent data. Um, she said you're referencing elections from a long time ago. Well, yes, and, and I'm and I'm I'm referencing them because uh, they're Canadian examples, and so that's helpful because often we you know we get people say, oh, you know, those results from other countries, you can't compare us to them. We're so unique and different, and so that's why it, it's helpful. The logic of what's going on in those elections is in some ways timeless. Uh, I mean, it shows us what happens when multiple parties compete against each other in, in a riding. You know, does the dynamic of party competition change or stay the same? So in that sense, I wouldn't discount historical evidence. But the difficulty that we have is that very few countries use the ranked ballot as their, their legislative representative system. And while we have the results from Australia, they are somewhat contaminated by the extra rules that they introduced. So in Australia, they use the alternative vote of the ranked ballot, but then they have this rule <clears throat> that says that voters have to rank you know, all of their choices over the whole ballot. And of course, the point of that is to force voters back into the arms of the largest parties. Um, so that, that's part of our, our, our challenge is that if we wanna understand the potential of what the alternative vote could do, well, then we have to relax that condition. And, and certainly the promoters of it here would say, well, we're not gonna do that. We're not gonna do like the Australians do. Um, so that's why we do a combination of looking at the Australian as well as some of the historic Canadian results. So it'd be nice if we had some modern and comparable examples, but we don't. Uh Jason Hammond is asking if one of the main concerns is that a liberal party dominance as a centrist party attracting second choices, is it fair to think that other centrist parties would emerge and make a liberal government replaceable after all? So the argument about the centrism of the liberals, you know, a lot of people glommed onto this and particularly the opponents of the liberal party uh, who, who, you know, basically smelled a rat uh, in the promotion of this particular system. Um, 
I mean, at the national level, it's not entirely clear that the alternative vote would significantly benefit the Liberal Party, uh, because not all parties are equally competitive in all the different regions of the country. Uh, and so, so in some cases, the Liberals aren't competitive. Uh, the battle is between, say, New Democrats and Conservatives. So arguably there, maybe, you know, some Liberals would go the NDP, some might go towards, uh, um, towards the Conservatives. But here in Ontario, things are a little different. And I do think that people feel that uh, the system is built to benefit the Liberal Party as a kind of dumping ground for everybody's second choices. Uh, of course, uh, there's also the Greens and that does complicate things as well. Um, but I do think that that, um, that that is the concern is that the, the Liberal Party would be disproportionately benefited by uh, the use of something like the ranked ballot. So we have a couple of questions about proportional representation. Um, one is, can't a ranked ballot be used within a proportional system? And another is, would PR not increase cooperation? Um, you said that it would increase competition. It seems to me that PR increases the likelihood that problems would be loved rather than positions competing mm -hmm. for dominance. It would be both. Um, so on the first question, yes, that exactly, right? And when I do my intro to, P, intro to voting systems, I, I talk about the component parts of a voting system, right? All voting systems have three parts, right? They've got... Um, uh, you know, they've got a, a decision rule, they've got a, a districting rule, and they've got uh, a, a, a rule about how to mark the ballot itself. And so, um, yes, you can have a ranking option in a proportional system, like the single transferable vote, and you can have a ranking option in a majority system, like the, the ranked ballot, the alternative vote. So yes, a lot of people mistake the ranking as the key thing, when in fact you can rank in both proportional and majority systems. Um, now, in terms of competition and cooperation, uh, both are true with PR. PR allows for greater competition if that's what voters want. If voters want to choose more parties, they have more freedom to do it in a proportional system. And that ultimately then leads to more cooperation. Uh, because people can choose what they want, uh, they're not forced to vote for big tent parties, um, then no party can say, oh, I don't want to work with anybody. I refuse to work with you. I'm not going to, I'm just going to run the show all on my own. In PR systems, that doesn't fly because it's very rare for a single party to get a majority of seats. So that means parties have got to cooperate with other parties. And what we see in PR systems is that voters often have a pretty good idea who is going to work with who. Sometimes parties say in the election, oh, we plan to work with this party if we are both elected. Uh, sometimes they, they work out a manifesto together uh, with a whole bunch of promises that they agree to endorse. Sometimes they work it out after the fact. But yes, both things are true, that PR systems are more competitive, they're more open, <clears throat> they, they, they do a better job of reflecting what voters <clears throat> want and what they say uh, with their votes. Uh, but then, because voters have many views, uh, they also force more cooperation onto the political system. So here's another popular question about proportional representation. How do you respond to the concern that extremist parties would gain a foothold and eventually power if there's PR and they cite the example that 5% of the popular vote was uh, PPC and they would have been entitled to 17 seats roughly? Well, look what's going on right now. I mean, our, our federal conservative party is being torn apart by you know people who who clearly uh, you know have have a sympathy with some of the things with the PPC. And the thing about PR systems is that yeah, they allow views to be represented that you like, and they allow views to be represented that maybe you don't like. Um, but the beauty of PR is that they are limited to exactly how much support they can get. Uh, as opposed to lurking within, you know, the bowels of another party. Uh, and so under our system with their big tent parties, often we don't know what kind of groups are vying for influence and trying to get the ear of the minister or, or, or the premier or the prime minister, um, you know, what's going on behind closed doors. In a PR system, that kind of stuff is much more transparent. And if we look at what's happened in PR systems over the 20th century, what's interesting is that, yeah, you know, so-called extremist parties, parties that people don't like, um, uh, parties that have views that are not near the mainstream or the median voter, they're, they are often uncoalitionable. Uh, they are, uh, you know, they pop up and, you know, people have their say, but no one works with them. No one will include them in a coalition. Or if they do get a piece of a coalition, they don't get 
a lot of what they're trying to go for because they're a minority position. So, I mean, ultimately, that's what it comes down to. When we look at the experience of what occurs in actual PR systems with countries that are comparable to Canada, uh, these parties are limited to their voting support. And over the 20th century, yeah, they came and went. As voters said, oh, I'm not getting anywhere voting for this party. Uh, nobody's working with them. So I, I better change my strategy. I better vote for someone else. I would prefer to see those, those views represented, but limited to the exact numeric amount of support that they have coming, rather than see them take over one of our existing parties and have influence that is way beyond what they really deserve in, the, in terms of the larger society. So Mathieu has a question, I think, which is kind of about messaging and communication with people. He's wondering if people in real life are as unwavering in their support of the IRV proposal from the OLP that they are, or as they are online. Um, it feels like talking to a wall when we try to explain to people that SDV is a direct upgrade to IRV. Right. <clears throat> well, it's not surprising that Liberal Party activists uh, who may be falling in line behind the policy are are not you're it's not you're not going to negotiate with them right they've come up with this strategy they think it's a winner uh, and so you know their their leader is offering it as you know a key element of of his political strategy you know you're not going to get a conversation with them about uh, well maybe we should try this um, that's that's not where this is going to go down uh, where it's going to go down is other voters who are unhappy with the choices. And so, you know, ultimately we have to say why, why won't, why won't our politicians stand up for the voters? Why won't they just represent, why won't they just um, uh, um, do what voters want? You know, the votes are a kind of communication. And in my view, that's the most reliable source of information, what people are prepared to mark on their ballot. And even with the constraints of our current voting system, we know that people aren't getting what they said. Uh, they're not getting what they voted for. And that's what we want. We want politicians who are going to champion to give people what they said they wanted with their votes. Um, and so, you know, all this stuff about the ranked ballot and, oh, we'll let people do this or that, it, it ends up being more distraction. You know, are you going to give people what they said they wanted with their votes? or not. It's as simple as that. Um, and, you know, ultimately, that's the test. That's what we have to try to get through to voters with. The ranked ballot is not going to give you the power that you deserve. You deserve to be able to get the representation that you said you wanted. So on, on that topic, uh, Gordon is asking, what exact process would have to be followed to change to PR both federally and provincially? Is a referendum or a large petition required to kickstart the transition? You know, these are, are, are you know, fascinating questions. Uh, legally, constitutionally, there's nothing stopping any uh, legislative majority in any legislature in Canada from simply changing the voting system. We have had 10 legislative uh, changes to the to the voting system in this country, provincially, uh, they've all been introduced by their legislature, they've all been repealed by the legislature. So there's absolutely nothing standing in the way from politicians just doing it. And my view is that, you know, this is a this is a, a question of justice, you know, do we believe that all votes should count and be represented in an election or not? And, you know, to me, the democratic argument is that we should go in that direction. So I don't want to put it to a vote because I don't think the people's voting rights should be put to a vote. Um, that's like saying, well, you know, if 50% of us think that the other 50% shouldn't, shouldn't have any voting rights, that's okay. That makes it legitimate. No, it doesn't. That, that's, we have a long history in Western countries of using referendums to deny people their civil, political, and electoral rights, and it's wrong. Uh, moving towards a more proportional voting system is further democratizing our, our creaky and, and less than democratic system. And we should just move in that direction. And all a party has to do, all a, a, a coalition has to do is simply introduce the legislation. Um, now, people might try to challenge it. Um, <clears throat> people might try to bring some sort of challenge forward uh, legally, but I don't think they've got a leg to stand on. Uh, you know, the court cases and the jurisprudence has suggested that a government can make this change if they want to, and that's the strategy that we should move on. What will be the trigger? That's the $64 million question. Uh, and, uh, but what my research suggests 
is that voting for more parties is the best method of getting towards a change to a proportional voting system. When we look historically and we look at the more recent reforms, they have almost always been presaged by increased instability in the party system. That's what encourages the legacy parties uh, to start to think about proportionality, is when suddenly there are more parties getting elected. So in a sense, you have to ignore some of the strategic calls and, and, and continue to vote for more parties, because more parties will ultimately uh, push, push the hand of the parties who want to keep the system constrained. So speaking of parties that want to keep the system, Mark is asking, why is first past the post such a challenge to change and why do parties cling to it? Oh, it's too good. I mean, you know, come on, a system that, that allows you to turn 40, well, in what we've seen recently, 39%. We had a British election where 35% of the popular vote turned into a legislative majority and 100% of the power, fantastic. That just sounds great, you know, to, to the party fixers. And sadly, you know, even some of the more progressive uh, parties have, have tended to fall in line with this logic that, well, you know, we need the power to be able to put our policies in place. Um, and and that's, that's basically it. I mean, in the case of some of our parties, the logic of the first past the post system is crucial to their reproduction as a party. You know, they, they encourage people to work for the party with a promise that once they gain majority government, they'll be able to reward them with jobs or with influence or appointments to boards. In terms of funders, this is, this is also crucial to the party because they go to the funders and they say, well, look, once we have majority power, then we'll be able to sneak through all those things that you want. But, you know, we have to get power first. So, you know, pile on the cash so that we can win. So in both cases, we have political parties that rely on first past the post to reproduce themselves as parties, you know, to get funding and then to get uh, 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 volunteers who will help them win power. And, you know, we've got to break the logic of that. And the way we do that is by affecting executive power. And proportional systems affect executive power by forcing a broader coalition to be assembled to exercise executive power. And that just sounds good. The bigger the coalition, the more people who will actually have a say and influence over what that government does. So I think you've probably just answered Ian's question. He's asking, uh, he said, you mentioned the backroom deals, corporate capture of the major parties and first past the post. Would proportional representation mitigate some of that influence and make it harder for lobbyist industry to influence a party in power? I mean, it wouldn't end it. If we look at proportional systems, those actors still exist. Um, and in some ways, I think that, you know, business uh, forces deserve to be heard. They have interests. They, they have expertise to offer government. So I'm not against lobbying. I'm not against influence. But it's a question of the public interest versus private interest. And I think that PR systems do a better job of safeguarding the public interest, or at least give the public a fighting chance, you know, to try to get some purchase on what governments do uh, and try to find out what's going on before policies are passed that are not in the public interest. Uh, it, it, PR will not lead to sunshine, lollipops and rainbows, um, but it does alter the competitive dynamic that exists. Uh, and it alters the power dynamic within our legislatures. And I think both of those things are a good thing. So Anonymous is asking if a PR system means that the big tent parties split into two or more parties. Is that what happened in New Zealand? Yes and no. Um, first of all, the adoption of different voting systems doesn't necessarily lead to anything. OK, there's no there's no determination going on. You know, you don't adopt a system, then automatically you get X results. We've had PR systems with very small uh, uh, party systems uh, like Austria. And we've had uh, first past the post systems with very broad uh, party systems like Canada. Uh, Canada has many parties compared to the United States or the United Kingdom. So. Um, but what we have seen in the shift to, to proportional systems is that they often follow the uh, increase in the size of the party system rather than create them. So as I said uh, earlier, you know, it's an increase in the number of parties that usually moves the political system and particularly legacy parties to consider uh, making a shift to PR. Um, in the case of New Zealand, 
uh, some of the party system breakdown was occurring before the adoption of PR. Uh, and so both labor and national had seen breakaway parties emerge before the adoption of PR. And that was one of the things that was moving the parties to become more interested in it was, uh oh, these breakaway parties were creating problems for them because sometimes they would deny the main party an ability to win an election. You know, if, if a breakaway party siphons off enough support, then it will prevent the main party from being able to win an election. After the introduction of PR, you did see the emergence of various other parties in the news. So the New Zealand system did become more competitive. It did become more representative. However, the two main parties that had dominated New Zealand, New Zealand politics continued to be the main parties. So national on the right, labor on the left, um, but they were joined by new parties that they had to work with uh, in terms of coming up with uh, an, a deal to exercise executive power. So we've only got three minutes left. So I think time for one question. And I think a good way to end it is I'll combine these two questions together of people asking, how we get PR. Pat is asking, do the moderates in the federal CPC, could they be enticed to work with the NDP to push for PR? Um, Mark is asking, uh, since Trudeau lied in 2015, why won't that happen again? How, what is the path to PR that's not that? Well, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm sorry that I don't have a clear answer. Of course, I wish I did, right? I mean, I've been working on this topic for three decades. And, uh, and you know, I, I can only use history as a guide. If anyone tries to tell you that there's some sort of formula that you can apply to get PR, um, you know, it just, it isn't the case. Um, what we have is a messy struggle. The reason why voting systems are, you know, we're told like voting systems are somehow, you know, a functional response to our needs or a reaction to our culture or, or maybe part of a social contract, everybody got together. No, none of that is true. Voting systems are the result of a taut, fraught political struggle between different sides that want to wring each other's necks. And we have seen changes in institutions as pressure has been brought to bear on, on, on conventional elites to increase the democracy in our system, to increase the substance of our democracy. Uh, and in some cases, that fear of democracy led elites to adopt PR. And in other cases, uh, it, it led them to resist PR. In today's context, a move to PR would be a dramatic improvement in the substance of our democracy. And as such, we can expect those who don't want democracy to vigorously resist it. Um, but that's our ace. If there's anything that we have in our corner, it's that we can push our democratic credentials and we can try to reach people who aren't blind partisans to say, isn't it time that we moved in a more democratic direction? Wouldn't more accurate representation be a good thing? Wouldn't it be better if one party didn't have all the power and control over the executive? And we can point to examples that appear to be working much better than ours, like New Zealand. So I, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't have a clear uh, cut answer, but that's the best I can do. Amazing. Thanks so much, Dennis. Uh, there's a few questions in the Q&A that we couldn't get to, but it's 745. So I think we have to pass this over to Anita and David now. And people are welcome to contact me if you want directly. If there's something I haven't addressed, you know, just Google me. You'll come up with my institutional address. I'm happy to, to follow up with anything that you might want to know about. Thanks so much, Dennis. We really